And then we run and put the gun away. And then we'd run to where the site of the kite flying was. And usually there'd be some kid standing there <laughs> with, a, with a, a string <laughs> and confused, not knowing what was going on. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to this special edition street you grew up on after dark. We're doing a late night edition because we're talking to an amazing late night talk show host, my amazing, hilarious, wonderful friend, Jimmy Kimmel. I'm so excited that I get to interview you because you've interviewed me like 20 times. That's right. <laughs> I know everything about you, Carrie. <laughs> so the tables must turn. <laughs> so I, as you know, I want to talk about the street you grew up on. So I just want to start by talking about like, what was the name of the street you grew up on? What city? What state? Well, I grew up on two streets, but okay. I'll probably focus more on the latter because I moved from Brooklyn. I lived on East 64th Street in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. in Mill Basin. Wow. And when we're, I was nine years old, we moved to Las Vegas and we lived on Meadowlark Lane my whole childhood. And what made you guys move from Brooklyn to Vegas? We moved because, uh, I mean, I will often say that uh, my father had a, um, a thing for hookers, but um, <laughs> that is not true. He, my father, the closest my father got to hookers was bowling. But uh, <laughs> we moved because... My uncle, Frank, was a police officer in New mm. York for 20 years. Wow. And he retired after 20 years. He was My uncle, Frank, famously made only six arrests in his 20-year career. God bless him. <laughs> I love him already. <laughs> and uh, he would just give people a talking to and try to straighten mm. them out. And um, Uncle Frank decided that they were going to move. And the original plan was to move to Florida. And they went to Florida. They stayed with some friends. This is my Uncle Frank and my Aunt Chippy, who's on the show. <laughs> and <laughs> they stayed with friends in Florida, and they found a house, and they put a $100 down payment, which doesn't sound like a lot, but, but to us then. in 1974, yeah. it was. And uh, later, later in the trip, there was an alligator in the pool in the no. backyard. No. And my Aunt Chippy said something to the effect of, I didn't raise three daughters so they could get eaten by a goddamn alligator. <laughs> and they lost the deposit and they decided to move to Las Vegas instead. My uncle got a job at the Riviera Hotel wow. as a security guard. And they brought my grandparents out with them. And ours is a very close Italian family. Mm. And so about a year and a half later, we packed up. And my dad didn't have a job. He's just going to get one when he got out there. Right. And we moved to Las Vegas, too. When I was wow. nine. And what was the street like? Like, what, what did the house look like? Was it a, on a street with lots of other houses? Or what was it like? It was a typical um, lower middle class tract home community. Mm -hmm. Beige houses, like three models of house. And, um, you know, In a you'd row. See, like, yeah, there were, there were like 12 of the same house on our, our, on our side of the street. Yep. And one was a two-story model. That's what we were in. Uh -huh. And we we're kind of at the end of the street. And it was very, I mean, there was no life whatsoever in our neighborhood when we moved in. It was just dirt and cement and stucco. And that's it. And But as the years went on, trees grew. And my wow. dad was always forcing me to help him in the lawn. And um, <laughs> I made my best friend who... Uh, is still my best friend who uh, is my band leader on my show, Cleto. And no. his dad lived across the street. No. Yes, right across the street from us. And we um, we grew up together. His dad was a saxophone player, and he quit being a professional saxophone player when he had a son because he didn't want to travel around the country. He wow. got a job as a room service waiter at Caesar's Palace. And um, then he had Cleto. Uh, he had Cleto and Cleto became a saxophone player and he was uh, like a child phenom oh. and he was like, like famous in our school and our town for being a great saxophone player at like 11 years old. And Cleto went on to become a professional sax player. And, um, I hired him to be my band leader when, when we started the show. Oh my gosh. That gave me And chills. his dad's in the band too. His no. dad was able to quit his job at Caesar's palace and become, uh, I have two saxophones in a five piece band <laughs> <laughs> is the, probably the best thing about uh, the job is being able to do that. 
Were there a lot of kids on the street? Was it, or was it kind of just you two or what was the, what was the vibe of the, the street? Yeah, there was, um, there were a few kids our age. There was a kid named Mark who lived down the block. There was another kid named Mitchell. Um, there were some kids at the end of the block, which, you know, when you're a kid and the end of the block <laughs> seems like another world. Like you it's need like, a passport to get to that block. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, we would have just enough to like play Nerf football. You know, yeah. it was, but mostly it was just me and Cleto, uh, screwing with the neighbors. Dude, there's one thing that we did on our block that w- now would be a national news story because it's so <laughs> incredibly stupid. But we were like, you know, 11 and 12 years old and Cleto's dad, who is the nicest man in the world, <laughs> um, is from Texas. He has, he, he would go bird shooting sometimes. He's got mm-hmm. a shotgun in his closet. Oh, no. And at the time, nobody locked their weapons up. So when his dad went to work, we would go into the closet. Whenever we saw a kite in the sky, oh god, we'd get the shotgun and shoot the kite out of the sky in the neighborhood, in the neighborhood. Wow. (laughs) And the kite would disappear. And then we'd run and put the gun away. And then we'd run to where the sight of the kite flying was. And usually there'd be some kid standing there. (laughs) With a, with a a string <laughs> and confused, not knowing what was going on. <laughs> but I really feel like now, like if that happened now, somebody oh, would yeah. shoot it with their phone. We would shoot it with the with the phone so we could see it happen. Totally. And we post it somewhere and I'd probably be in prison. So I feel really truly blessed that I get to work with you as a producer on these live specials. And I was thinking like, oh, was it at Meadowlark that you fell in love with the Norman Lear world and sort of where your adoration Even for earlier, him began? Really, really? In Brooklyn is when, uh, uh, yeah, really All in the Family, I think, was our first, the first show that we loved as a family, the first Norman mm-hmm. Lear show. Mm-hmm. But for me, when I got to Las Vegas and you'd watch these shows and reruns, yeah, I, Sanford and Son, Sanford and Son and Good Times are really my those were the shows that I watched the most. Mm -hmm. It feels, I know real is a dumb thing to say because it's not real, but it did feel like there was some reality. Honest. There was some honesty to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you have siblings? Who was in that house on Meadowlark with you? Who lived in the house? I'm the oldest. I have a sister, Jill, who's three years younger and a brother, Jonathan, who is nine years younger. And what was your role? Like, as the oldest, were you kind of the leader? Were you funny back then in your family? Were you like, what was what was the role you played? Everyone in my family is funny. L- mm. Literally, every person in my family is funny. I am like the eighth funniest person in my family. <laughs> um, I was, you know, as the oldest, you run roughshod over the family. You know, yeah. I did all the things that the older brother does. You know, yeah. Um, from a general torturing your siblings <laughs> standpoint. I um, I was an artist when I was a kid. I loved to draw. I was mm. kind of known for that. Everyone always presumed I would become an artist when I grew up, including me. I have to tell you, by the way, that your goose book is a family fave in our house. Oh, great. And you illustrated that book. I did. I. That's the only time I've really had the opportunity to do, like, in a professional way, um, something that I thought I might do when I, I got older. I, I love television. I would stay up much later than I should have watching David Letterman. Mm-hmm. Well, my parents, my dad is a little tight, you know, mm-hmm. and um, we had, I think we got our first color TV in, I know that to younger people, these numbers mean <laughs> nothing, but we got our first color TV in 1984. Before that, That's we had a 12 late. inch black and white television That's set in our living room. Super late. <laughs> and yeah, it was very late. Wow. Very, we didn't get cable till I was in college. And only because <laughs> I demanded it as a condition of moving to Arizona with my parents. But it's like you were like uh, Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz when you got a color TV, <laughs> like the world was in Technicolor. When did you know that you were funny? Because if you thought that you were going to be a visual artist and everybody else in the family was funny and you love these funny shows, when did you feel like, oh, some of this might live in me? I, you know, I always knew I was funny. I would make crank calls. And (laughs) in fact, when I was in high school, like 
at parties, people would make, I'd get on the speakerphone and people would make me make prank calls to our really? other schoolmates and friends. And yeah, I, we would tape our, we had a little device. We bought a radio shack. It was a suction cup. We put on the back of the telephone wow. and it would plug into a tape recorder and we tape these calls <laughs> And then we'd make fake commercials. You know, that's a federal uh, crime in some places, Jimmy. <laughs> not in, not in Nevada. In Nevada, Got you it. can tape, you can do anything. <laughs> that's <laughs> true. Everything's legal right. in Nevada. <laughs> that's right. And um, we, we just, you know, we, we write little songs. In fact, Cleto was um, always took piano lessons, mm. and he would play this exercise song, and it went. And so we would make up little songs about our friends and our neighbors and, you know, brothers and sisters, all these, these funny little tunes and we taped them and we were always like <laughs> working on something funny. And, um, and I never thought it would add up to anything. Um, so I want to ask about some of your other super funny family members, like wondering if you have a cousin Mickey story from your time on Meadowlark. Mickey was kind of a punk kid, really. Um, she was like a, little squinty eyed punk of a kid, <laughs> almost like one of the little rascals or something. And I do remember as a little kid, I remember, uh, she lost, we went up to Lake Mead, our mm. aunt, our, our uncle Maurice and aunt, um, Anne were visiting. And so we went up to Lake Mead, which is what we did with everyone who visited us. And by the <laughs> way, nothing to see there. Just like, <laughs> Just a <laughs> reservoir, you know? <laughs> so we took them up to Lake Mead and Mickey somehow, she was kicking and she lost her shoe and the shoe floated away. Uh, you know, we're on the dock. And so my grandfather was good at horseshoes and my uncle Maurice <laughs> was also good at horseshoes. So they got some rocks and they figured if they throw the rocks beyond the shoe, oh, no. the ripple will push <laughs> the shoe back to shore. But uncle Maurice on the first shot, Landed the rock right in the shoe, and the shoe went right <laughs> down. To the and Mickey was so mad at him; she didn't like. She didn't forget it for years. Wow! Oh, I love <laughs> it. I love it. Sounds like your family spent a lot of time together. Did, did my how, parents? Yeah, didn't have any friends. My <laughs> um, and it's not because they weren't entertaining people; it's mm -hmm. they had no time for their friends because we were only over at my grandmother's house. Mm. She lived with my aunt and uncle. And that's mm. where we were every weekend. We'd go there. We'd have dinner. I could smell the, I could smell the garlic when we pull up to mm. the driveway. My grandmother was a fat woman. She was short and Italian. She made great Italian food. And uh. I would be ravenously hungry when I walked in the door. Okay. So if you could have one of those like great Italian Sunday dinners and invite five characters from Norman's shows, which five characters would oh, you invite to dinner? I would say, well, I'd say Fred Sanford. You know what? I think Fred Sanford and Aunt Esther together would be a great, <laughs> a similar dynamic between some members of my family. Yes. Um, I've always loved Grady too. I, I might have <laughs> invite Grady. Um, let's see. Oh, Edith Bunker would have been mm. would have been beloved in the house and so helpful. She would have been so helpful at dinner. And Maud, yeah, she would have cleaned up and yeah, everything. And yeah. Maud would be, yeah, mm. Maud definitely. Oh, that's a, that is a great five, dinner. Right? Yeah, yeah, that would be a good dinner. That's a good <laughs> dinner. So, um, if you could, you know, go back to that kid. Did you? Did they always call you Jimmy? Were you always Jimmy? Yeah, my dad is my dad's Jim and ah, I'm Jimmy. So Okay. All right. So if you could go back to Jimmy on Meadowlark, you know, around when you moved there, is there anything you'd want to say to him? Advice hmm. you'd want to give him? Well, one thing I would say is enjoy eating a lot because <laughs> that's going to end. <laughs> and you don't realize how wonderful. I, I wish it was the other way. Like, you know, it should you be the eat. other way. Yeah. It should be the other way when you don't like any foods because you're a kid. They don't appreciate anything and they can eat everything. I know it should be the opposite. It's a flaw in the human body. <laughs> um, I think I would tell, I think I would tell that kid to not worry so much, I guess. Mm. You know, you're scared of everything when you're a kid. I, I, I was scared of most adults. Uh, I was scared of, 
bringing anything other than an A back on my mm. report card. Um, in fact, if I got something other than an A, I would use my artistic abilities to change the letter <laughs> on the report no. card to an A. Wow. That happened. Yeah. Were your parents really <laughs> strict about grades? Were you scared with, with good reason? My dad didn't. I don't think my, my dad didn't. I asked my dad the other day, uh, he was going into some long, boring story about some car repair he had done like 50 years ago. And I said, dad, what sixth grade did I go to? What school? And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> so, so he was not, no, he, he was not that in. one. <laughs> yeah. He was going to work every day and he came home. We didn't want to hear about where we were going to school. Yeah. But in fact, the one time I think my dad uh, picked me up from school I was sick and I called home and my mother didn't answer the phone. I don't know where she was. So I had to call him at work mm. and he just bought a new Dodge Murata, which mm. is one of the worst cars ever <laughs> manufactured. <laughs> and I'd thrown up in class and I, oh, I was, no. you know, Covered. I was a mess. Mm -hmm. And I remember I got, I was about to get in the car. He's like, he didn't know what to do because he didn't <laughs> want me in the car. He knew he had to take me home, <laughs> but he, I remember he went and got like some towels. He's like, don't move. Don't move. <laughs> <laughs> but so my loving. mother, it's not that she was strict because she wasn't really. There was a level of expectation mm -hmm. that we, all of us, me, my sister, my brother, were going to be smarter than everyone else in the class. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get perfect grades. And if they were not perfect, she was not impressed. Wow. <laughs> yeah. 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 Did you have any teachers that were really important to you who kind of encouraged you or saw the yes. potential in you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had some, I had, you know, I went to public school my whole life. I had some great teachers and some really smart teachers. One of the things, what, a terrible thing a teacher did to me. Oh, no. Uh, a teacher named Mr. Mills. It wasn't really terrible. I mean, he was in the right, certainly, but it was diabolical is really what it was. <laughs> Mr. Mills was, he thought I was funny. I knew he thought I was funny. And, mm -hmm. but he didn't want to let on that he thought I was funny. So we had this mm -hmm. weird relationship. And at a certain point, his class, which was U.S. history, became just a comedy show for me. There was no, <laughs> I mean, like I, I was joking through the whole class mm. and everyone was laughing. It was the highlight of my day every day. And I loved it. And I would, I'd raise my hand and say stupid things and everybody would laugh. One day he pulls me out in the hall. He's just had enough. And he said, no more jokes, one more joke. And you get an F you fail. And this was terrifying to me because if I brought an F home, I never had an F in my life. And I mean, I, I would have been in a lot of trouble <laughs> yeah. if I, so I took it seriously. And I was like, but then the class, like a couple weeks went by and the class started to revolt. They were angry that I had been. Mm, they missed and you. This is, this is when he did the most diable thing, diabolical thing anyone's ever done to me in my life, probably. He said, okay, you could tell one joke a week. Oh. And I would sit there all week <laughs> and I'd save it till Friday, usually, unless I had something great, then maybe I'd spend it on a Wednesday, but <laughs> I'd sit there all week sweating. But then on Friday, the pressure is on because mm. if it's dud, mm -hmm. you gotta, you've got a whole week to yeah. wait. And, um, and he t it tortured me, really. It really did torture me. But wow. when I did get a really good one off, the one joke of the week, I just look at him like, <laughs> like <laughs> I win. <laughs> <laughs> he also told me, and I, I actually shared this story when I hosted the White House Correspondents Dinner. Um, he told me that if I kept screwing around, I was never going to make anything of myself. <laughs> and I was like, well, here I am with President Obama and the First Lady of the United States, Mr. Mills. <laughs> Touche. Is there anything when you think about Meadowlark and you kind of revisit these memories, is there anything that you wish you had from that time or that place in your life now? Like things you'd want to incorporate into your world now? Um, yes. And I know this is going to sound kind of dumb, but sports, you oh, know, what do you mean? when I was a kid, every day it was something we were boxing, we mm. were playing wiffle ball, we were playing Nerf football, 
it was always, always some some kind of a sports activity. And now as an adult, I really, you know, it just, you know, like I'll go in the gym and I try to work out, but there's no sports, you know, like if I play basketball for more than an hour, I'll definitely get injured. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's you can't play wiffle ball when you're an adult. It looks dumb. And I just don't have that anymore. You know, yeah. it's uh, uh, and my kids are little, so I'm hoping maybe they get involved in it and I can go out and coach or something. Yeah. Do you think you miss the actual like physical movement or the community of being with other people? No, yeah, I miss the competition. I mm. miss the ball busting. I miss mm. the arguing. Um, I the miss the, like, I miss the emotional highs and lows of winning and losing, you know, um, you know, I, I miss all that stuff. It's so great. Like the things that really matter to you, you know, at different stages of your life, the things that are yeah. the ultimate priority. Um, okay. So I just have one more question for you really, which oh, is yeah. like a silly you know, your sexy alter ego name is the name of your first pet and the street you grew up on. So oh, I want to know okay. what your. <laughs> well, mine is very sexy. In fact, uh, I- I'm worried that you might leave your husband when you, you hear this <laughs> Bring it. one. Bring it's it. so sexy. Fluffy Meadowlark. <laughs> <laughs> the best fluffer in town. Fluffy Meadowlark. Oh, I didn't even think of that. <laughs> Oh, I'm not even, I'm like not even in the adult film. I'm the one facilitating it. You're behind the scenes. You're so good. Always the producer. <laughs> oh, Fluffy oh, Metalark. So That's my name. I like that. I like that. It feels a little more like a children's book character, but. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I like it. <laughs> well, thank you. This was so fun. This was fun. Yes, I enjoyed it. Thank you, Jimmy Kimmel, for taking us with you to Vegas. I loved hearing about his life, his childhood on Meadowlark Lane. I feel like I just laughed through that entire interview. Um, So thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for tuning in. I want to know who else you want to hear about, what other streets you want to journey back to, who else you want to travel with to the street that they grew up on. So make sure you write that in the comments. Also, like and subscribe and push the notifications buttons so that you get news from us and please continue to tune in it's so much fun to share these interviews with you thanks